The domain of Haslin is a curious one, and for two reasons. First, it presents a very specific vision of fantasy horror, but with few if any cultural touchstones other than Dungeons and Dragons itself. And secondly, if you look at the domain in any detail, you realize that whoever came up with it clearly wanted you to run an adventure that tells the story of Steven Spielberg's 1984 film, Gremlins. So we're going to discuss both of those two things, how to get a sense for the domain itself, and how to run a low-level adventure that is basically Gremlins. Welcome to phd and everyone, I'm Dr. Bowers, and we're talking about the Ravenloft domain of Haslin. As I just mentioned, Haslin takes much of its inspiration from Dungeons & Dragons itself. The basic intent is to present a domain in which wizardly magic is everywhere, and which has kind of ruined everything. Now, as a result of magical experimentation, there are exceptions to the laws of nature everywhere, there are all kinds of aberrant monsters. And everywhere, on every inscribable surface, there is the Eye of Haslick, a symbol or a glyph that resembles an eye, through which the Domain Lord Haslick can look at any time, basically functioning as a personal security cam for him. It's a domain full of magical disasters in which an arch wizard sees all. Now that's easy enough to describe, but when you're thinking about it as a setting, when you're trying to imagine it, when you're trying to get a grip on what it's supposed to be, the fact that its flavor just comes from Dungeons & Dragons itself threatens to make it seem a little uninspired. Barovia, after all, is Dungeons & Dragons, but inspired by Bram Stoker's Dracula and other vampire stories. Lamordia is Dungeons & Dragons, but with a flavor of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or H.P. Lovecraft's Reanimator and other weird science associated with body horror. Blutspur is Dungeons & Dragons, but with horror inspired by alien abductions. And what's Haslin? It's Dungeons & Dragons inspired by horror from Dungeons & Dragons. You see the problem? Or rather, I should say potential problem, because it's not really a problem. Here are a few sources which I think help any DM get an imaginative grip on what the domain is supposed to feel like. First, the 1985 film Return to Oz. Oz is a land that is infused with magic, and you'd think that that would mean it was whimsical and wonderful to be there. But instead, it's an eerie, macabre place full of horrible things. There is a desert whose sands claim the life of anyone who touches them, turning them into sand, the deadly desert. There are ruins of once majestic cities in which people have been turned to stone and their heads have been cut off, and who knows in which order. There are strange aberrant creatures that don't make a lot of sense, and there are rogue magicians commanding them, such as Princess Mombi. And of course, overall, the entire domain functions as a massive security complex in which every rock and stone, every pebble, is a security camera for the Gnome King, the ruler who sees all. This is very much like Haslin. Haslin, too, is a domain infused with magic, which would make you think it would be whimsical to be there, but actually it's just full of horrible mutant things. There are rogue magicians running around commanding experiments, and the Eye of Haslick is just as present all across Haslin as rocks and stones are across Oz. The second source of imaginative inspiration for Haslin is the novel Born by Jeff Vandermeer. Born takes place in a setting which has been ravaged by the apocalyptic forces of a biotech company that has lost control of its experiments. Every settlement has been laid to waste, and the wilderness has been transformed into an alien, horrible landscape. Across the land you can find pools and lakes of roiling, boiling, primordial goo full of DNA and microscopic biotech equipment. Out of these basins crawl and creep all manner of genetic horrors. Strange combinations of tooth and claw, fur, feather, and fang from distant phylogenetic branches. All aberrant, all eldritch, all hungry and territorial. What little civilization is left has been eclipsed in turf wars between rogue geneticists who give themselves flashy names like The Magician. And this too, I think, perfectly emulates the feel that would be right for Haslin. Think of magic as like a kind of biotech. It corrupts and twists and mutates life, deforming it, sculpting it into monsters. And speaking of which, the final set of inspirations are random bits of media, and they are both random and bits because, again, the main inspiration for Haslund's horror is Dungeons & Dragons itself. Still, first off, in the 1988 film Willow, there's a particular scene in which Willow zaps a troll with a magic wand, and the troll flies back and mutates horribly into some kind of aberrant creature.
Willow is disgusted, kicks the thing into the lake, and that thing quickly grows into a horrible giant dragon-esque monster. It's a great example of magic eliciting a certain kind of body horror as well as experimentation. I say experimentation because the point of inspiration is this. Take that transformation of troll into monster, I mean, other monster, and imagine someone was going around doing things like that on purpose. That's what the wizardly servants of Haslan do, after all. Then there's also a pilot for a cartoon series that never aired on the Cartoon Network called Korgoth of Barbaria. If you watch that pilot, you'll find a few monsters that are aberrant creatures, which I think would be appropriate to Haslan, such as the tree with eyes and fangs. And then there's an episode from Season 4 of She-Ra Princess of Power called Beast Island, and the setting of that episode is very similar to what I imagine Haslan to be like in some ways. Wild and overrun with mysterious alien magic gone awry, and full of menacing monsters created by magical experimentation. Anyway, those are a few sources to get a feel for what kind of a domain Haslan is supposed to be. Frightened medieval peasants in a low-technology setting, cowering in the shadow of wizardly powers, which on a whim do all sorts of disruptive, horrifying things. A wizard might say, oh, I found a way to make rocks feel pain. I turn them into these fleshy things and make sure that they feel pain for their entire immortal existence. Better still, I can graft mouths onto them, and by shaping the mouths and how they express the pain that they feel, by adjusting the pitch and the volume, I could have a whole field of these living, suffering boulders wailing in pain at different pitches so that they together form a kind of harmonious chorus. And then I can have them change in their pitch, and so they play out this really cool song. Do the people in the nearby village care about the chorus of wailing from my moraine of beautiful, living, perpetually suffering boulders? Who cares? Or a wizard says, I found a way to make it perpetually rain asteroids in a three square mile area, because after all, one in every thousand asteroids has something valuable in it for my research. Do alien horrors from beyond the stars sometimes come down with the asteroids? Well, sure. Does it pose a horrifying threat to the people who live nearby? Oh, sure, but who cares? And horrible experiments like that. So, having discussed the domain of Haslan, having discussed what it's like and how to imagine it, let's talk about the flagship monster of the domain, the Gramishka. The Gramishka is a tiny monster about the size of a cat that has huge ears, fangs, and a penchant for both malice and mischief. It has an unusual feature where, if exposed to a common element under certain conditions, it will reproduce with incredible rapidity, so that one may easily become hundreds or even thousands. If you've seen the 1984 Steven Spielberg movie Gremlins, you remember that Gremlins were tiny monsters about the size of a cat that had big ears and had a penchant for both malice and mischief. They had a feature where, if exposed to a common element under certain conditions, they would reproduce with a certain rapidity going from one to hundreds or even thousands in a very short amount of time. If you exposed gremlins to water, they would explode into a swarm of gremlins. And likewise, if you expose a gremishka to magic, they can explode into a swarm of gremishkas. And heck, both monsters even begin with the syllable grem. So whoever designed the gremishka was clearly thinking gremlins. So we're going to put together a short adventure which is very much like the movie Gremlins, but which takes place in Haslan and which concerns gremishkas. This adventure is going to have five parts, or five acts. In the first act, the PCs are going to be charged with watching over a Gramishka, and things get out of hand. In the second act, the PCs are charged with trying to quell a series of swarms of Gramishkas which have overrun the town of Toyalis. In Act 3, we have a chase scene from Toyalis into the Fleshless Forest. In Act 4, the PCs travel from the Fleshless Forest back to Toyalis. And at Act 5, the PCs return to Toyalis and finally deal with the Gramishka threat once and for all. This adventure should take PCs from levels 1 to 5, or maybe 2 to 6 if you're being generous, and it will mostly focus on the player character's effort to keep things under control when they are very clearly out of control, and to try to put things back in order before their wizardly master comes back and deals out lethal punishment for what they've allowed to happen. Now here's an important framing device for this entire adventure. We are going to allow for there to be two different kinds of Gramishkas. There are the normal Gramishkas, and then there are striped Gramishkas. 
and the difference is that while normal Gromishkas can be killed when reduced to zero hit points, and they can be reduced to zero hit points in a variety of ways, striped Gromishkas cannot be killed except for in a very specific ritual. If a striped Gromishka is reduced to zero hit points, and not with that specific ritual, they just explode into a swarm of Gromishkas, one of whom is striped. In Act 1, our adventure begins with the PCs serving as underlings for an important wizard in Haslan. This wizard is Eleni, and she has an observatory and laboratory within the city of Toyalis. For a map, I would use the Oracular Conflux on page 143 of Mythic Odysseys of Theros, just change the Shrine of Karanos into a shrine dedicated to Haslik, change the flavor so that things are more dark and wizardly, but otherwise it's a great map to use. Eleni is going to present the PCs with a sleeping, striped Grimishka. In fact, this is the very first Grimishka ever created. She explains to the PCs that this is her newest experiment, and that she wants them to watch over it, make sure that it doesn't do any damage, and that it is not damaged either in her week-long absence. She is traveling to the other side of the country, to the Mound of the Worm, in order to charm the giant albino purple worm Grave Drinker. It should take a week, and then she'll be back, and all she asks the PCs to do is watch over this new experiment, make sure that it isn't damaged and that it doesn't damage anything, and of course, if they fail, she'll come back and kill them. The PCs know that there's no use in hiding, there's no use in fighting, Eleni is a powerful arch wizard, she will absolutely come back and kill them if they fail in the mission that they have just been prescribed. And off she goes. Now at first you can allow the PCs to examine the Grimishka as it sleeps, maybe mention that it's cute and how it has this cute little white stripe on its head, but shortly after Eleni leaves, the Grimishka wakes up and starts wreaking havoc. It jumps around, it starts eating magical items, and if the PCs reach for it or try to interact with it, it'll bite them. I like to think that when the Grimishka bites on an attack roll of natural 20, it bites off a finger. Remember, we do want this to be a horror campaign. It can be silly, horror can be silly, but we gotta keep it scary too. So the Grimishka is going nuts and the PCs are trying to keep it under control, stop it from wreaking havoc and trying to subdue it. At some point, the PC should either accidentally or on purpose reduce it to zero hit points, or just cast a spell on it. Either way, when that happens, have the Grimishka explode into a swarm of Grimishkas, only one of which has a stripe, and have that swarm crawl out of the windows, out of the doors, and towards Toyalis from Eleni's tower. At that point, the PCs level up to two, and we go to the next act. Assuming the PCs know what's good for them, Act 2 begins with them rushing out following the swarm of Grimishkas into the streets of Toyalis, and what they witness is chaos and mayhem. To keep the horror atmosphere of the adventure, we're going to want to describe how Grimishkas are attacking various villagers, eating their faces off, scratching up their limbs, devouring livestock as it's still alive, and all the while cackling and giggling and clapping their hands. Remember, Grimishkas are intelligent, and that means that they're intelligent enough to do cruel things. Again, think of the gremlins from that movie. They're going to be torturing livestock and people, it's going to be horrifying. I might not describe the torture in detail, you could just say that they're torturing livestock and people and leave it at that. But in any case, your PC's goal should be to kill all of the non-striped Grimishkas, which are everywhere, and to give this scene some structure, we're going to have three different combat set pieces. In the first combat set piece, we'll say that there's a swarm of Grimishkas at the top of a hill or at the top of a staircase, and that they are rolling barrels down the hill or the staircase towards the PCs. The PCs must make a DC 10 dex save to avoid being hit by one of these barrels, and being hit by one of these barrels results in 1d4 bludgeoning damage plus conferring the prone condition. Give the swarm of Grimishkas a legendary action so that they can do this more than once per turn, and it should make it fun for the PCs to go up the hill or up the staircase to stop the barrels from rolling down and kill the swarm of Grimishkas. In the second action set piece, just let the PCs rescue an animal or a piece of livestock from the Grimishkas. Because of the dark fantasy setting, I like to imagine those chicken leg things, what are they called, cockatrices from Golden Axe? There were these like purple Yoshi animals that had parrot beaks and you could ride them around and they would swing their tails. I don't know why, I just imagine that Haslan has these instead of horses. So let the PCs rescue one of these from a swarm of Grimishkas. After they rescue it, they have the option of using animal handling to tame it and use it as a mount. Make the DC 10. And for the final action set piece, say that a swarm of Grimishkas are in a kind of pig sty, or maybe chicken leg cockatrice sty, and they are hurling globs of filth at the PCs. When they hurl a glob of filth at a PC, that PC must succeed on a DC 10 dex save, or else gain the blinded condition until they use an action to wipe the filth away. 
Amidst this, of course, another swarm of Grimishkas will also be attacking the PCs. And once the PCs kill all of the Grimishkas and all those action set pieces, we can say that they witness an unfortunate sight. The striped Grimishka that they were originally chasing has now just leapt astride a chicken leg or cockatrice, and it is riding it on the road out of town! Might not even know exactly what it's doing, but there goes the Grimishka that you're supposed to watch! So the PCs must chase after it. Level up to three. And now we're in Act 3, which should be a chase scene. The striped Grimishka got a head start and is charging ahead, holding onto the reins of an out-of-control chicken leg or a cockatrice. And the PC should have had opportunities to get their own chicken legs or cockatrices and chase after the Grimishka. Here you should run the chase scene however seems most comfortable for you. There are a lot of different homebrew rules about how chase scenes should work, in addition to the official rules in the DMG. I would try to involve certain kinds of action set pieces here. Let's say that the PCs and their quarry all have to jump across a chasm. Let's say that the PCs might end up side by side with their quarry only to exchange fire as the quarry throws rocks at them. And then maybe at that point, the Grimishka suddenly slows down and veers directions, causing the chase to veer off in a different course. Ultimately, this chase is going to take the Grimishka and the PCs into the fleshless forest. When they arrive, Level up to four. In Act 4, the PCs find themselves in the fleshless forest, so-called because every single tree, every single blade of grass, and every single animal which once lived in it have all been turned to stone. It's a whole forest biome, petrified. The PCs catch up to the Grimishka there, as their chicken leg cockatrices tire, and here they have an opportunity to actually capture the striped Grimishka. If the players have a plan of how to capture it, let that plan succeed, or at least let it have a good chance of succeeding here. The PC should be able to grab the Grimishka, secure it in a bag or something, and not have to worry about it this chapter, except for when worrying about it becomes fun. Shortly after capturing the striped Grimishka, the PCs should realize to their horror that their chicken leg cockatrice mounts have turned to stone as well. Have them roll a high DC constitution save, and if they fail, have them notice that their own skin is beginning to turn gray and flaky. They are succumbing to some kind of stony curse and must leave as soon as possible. So this act consists of the PCs wandering through a petrified forest, trying to escape it on foot and find the right road back to Toyalis? and throughout the whole way they are attacked by shadow demons, and maybe shadows as well. The Fleshless Forest is a fascinating setting, and it's a cool place to have other random encounters. You might want to take some monsters from the table in Van Richten's Guide on Dark Fantasy. Once the PCs make it to the edge of the Fleshless Forest, back on the road to Toyalis, let them level up to 5. Once at level 5, the PCs begin Act 5 returning to Toyalis, and once they get back to Eleni's tower, she returns, livid. It turns out that she did not entirely trust the PCs, and has, with her master's permission, used the Eye of Hazluck to spy on the PCs. She is aware of their mismanagement, but decided not to kill them this time. Instead, she can see that she made a mistake, and is going to show the PCs how to get rid of a striped Grimishka. She leads the PCs to her shrine dedicated to Hazlick, and then performs an arcane ritual, and let's make it a spooky ritual, candlelight and blood being drawn and stuff like that. She uses this ritual to destroy the striped Grimishka, or so she thought. Rather than destroying the striped Grimishka, it causes the Grimishka to increase to a gargantuan size. It breaks through the ceiling and knocks the roof off. Now it's this enormous, gargantuan creature. And before Eleni has a chance to act, it stomps on her and kills her. Then it turns towards the PCs. Boss fight time. And now it's just up to the PCs to defeat this gargantuan Grimishka, which in this form can actually be destroyed finally once and for all. And once they do, Eleni will revive by way of a backup prepared resurrection spell that would be triggered in the event of her demise. And the adventure will conclude with the PCs leveling up to 6. As for the giant Grimishka, I would use the statistics for a frost giant skeleton from Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden. Those creatures are a CR 6, which is not too hard for the PCs, and they are pretty big. It's not too hard to increase their size to gargantuan, just keep everything else the same. And the PCs should have a lot of fun fighting it. So anyway, that's our delve into the nature of the domain Haslin, and that's our little low-level adventure for that domain as well. What do you think? Does that adventure sound pretty fun to run and play? Or would you do something totally different for the domain of Haslin? You'll notice that I didn't involve the Dark Lord in this adventure. Would you have involved Haslik? If so, how? Which maps would you have used? Let me know in the comments. As always, thanks very much for watching this video. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more content on this channel. And don't forget to hit the bell icon if you want notifications as soon as new content comes up. Thanks very much.